Welcome to the MetaQuest podcast. Today I am speaking with Gordon Gallup, who is a true legend in the halls of science. You may be familiar with the mirror test. I remember reading about this over a decade ago, and it actually struck me as so profound that I think it changed my thinking radically. A kind of we're not alone type feeling. You learn all about it in this episode. First off, just a little housekeeping. We still rely on ads here, but I'll keep them short and informative. Also, please let me know who you'd like to see, listen to on this podcast. Gordon and I agreed to do a second video later, so also feel free to let me know what topics you want us to cover. Ask us any question, essentially. Finally, a brief thank you to Crypto.com, who supports this podcast financially. I use their crypto and fiat debit card for all my purchases, and if you want this neat metal card, a free $50 and a 2% or even a 3% cash back on all your purchases, please use the referral link in the show notes or the comment section. That's it for today's housekeeping. Now, although Dr. Gordon Gallup is most widely known for his work on self-recognition in animals, he has done much more work than that. His resume is 43 pages long and obviously I can't do him justice in a short introduction here. What I can do is say that he has published dozens if not hundreds of scientific articles and I can just mention his main research interests. Those pertain to evolution and behavior, human reproductive competition, predator-prey relations, self-awareness and social cognition, and schizophrenia as a self-processing disorder. His teaching interests are evolutionary psychology, philosophy of science, experimental psychology, and experimental psychopathology. I also just want to say that the talk Gordon and I had turned out to be one of the most profound conversations I've had for years, honestly. I end up disclosing personal information that I decided not to share publicly. So it's an intense conversation. And our main topic is self-awareness in animals and in humans, but we branch out quite a lot from there. Gordon also reveals several pieces of information about self-awareness that were completely new to me. And I'm not going to spoil it by revealing anything here, but I dare say you are in for a serious treat with this talk. The talk was so long that I decided to cut it in two, so I'll publish the second half within a few days. So stay tuned for that. And as always, please subscribe. doesn't cost you anything, but it has value to me. And now I bring you Dr. Gordon Gallup Jr. Welcome on the podcast. Thank you. My pleasure. No, the pleasure really is mine. Um, and I want to say I'm a huge fan. And the reason I'm a huge fan is I had a psychology professor who was smart enough to put an original source in a compendium, which was your 1970 article uh, called Chimpanzees Self-Recognition. Right. And it actually really made a huge impact on my academic thinking, but really also on my personal life. Wow. I'm so, flattered. Uh, no, yeah, no, you, you, you earned it, I, I think. Um, and it's so obvious to me today that I almost can't believe that I used to be unaware that other animals and humans could have self-awareness. That's been a that's been a, a bone of major contention, uh, right? Not right. only among not only among psychologists and neuroscientists, but among philosophers as well, as I'm sure you uh, you appreciate. Right, right, exactly. I was actually hoping we could talk about the period leading up to the publication of this article, but but. In the interest of making this entertaining, I want to start with um, a quote from an abstract from a 1982 paper you published, I believe. I'm just going to pull it up here. Uh, and this, I, I believe I'm quoting you now. So the paper is called Self-Awareness and the Emergence of Mind in Primates. And I'm quoting you now. 
an attempt is made to show that self-awareness, consciousness, and mind are not mutually exclusive cognitive categories and that the emergence of self-awareness may be equivalent to the emergence of mind. That's exactly right. Right. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? Well, I think, I think self-awareness, consciousness, and mind, although we can def- differentiate between these as we, as we move forward, but according to my analysis, they're all part and parcel of the same underlying process. And self-awareness is what eventually gives rise to and underpins and makes conscious awareness and social intelligence possible. Right. And, and I, I, I equate social intelligence with mind, the, the ability to make inferences about what are the other organisms uh, no want or intend to do right this is the concept commonly referred to as theory of mind you're just correct here, right? right metal state attribution theory of mind um and according to the way i think about it <clears throat> self-awareness is represented by the capacity to become the object of your own attention Consciousness is bi-directional. You can be aware of things going on in the world around you, or you can direct that awareness toward yourself. You can, you're, you're not only aware of your own existence, but you can begin to think about yourself as it relates to things that may have happened in the past, things that are happening now, and even things that haven't happened yet, projecting right projecting yourself in, into the future. So you can use your ability to become the object of your own attention to engage in what some people call mental time travel of sorts. Right. And, and the advantage of being able to become the object of, of your own attention and being able to conceive of yourself is that you're in a position to then begin to use your experience to make inferences about comparable experiences in other people or even other animals. And and although many people would be quick to argue that no two people ever have exactly the same experience, and I would agree, but because you and I are members of the same species, there's bound to be considerable overlap between your experience and my experience because we share common receptors and we share common uh, neurological features. Right. So yes. I, can, I can then begin to use my experience to, to map imperfectly onto your experience. And I can also then take my feelings and and my mental states as they relate to things that are happening in the world around me so that i can begin to not only be, can use my experience to make inferences about your experience but i can begin to use my mental states to make inferences about comparable mental states in right. other people and maybe even in other creatures. So, so let me ask you a follow-up question. This is not going as I planned at all, but it's, okay, <laughs> that's, that's a good fine. thing. That's fine. <laughs> right. We, we can uh, pick up loose ends at any point. Right, right. So I just concluded another interview with a guy called Gregory Hickok. I don't know if you're familiar with his Gregory... word. Gregory Hickok. No, I'm not A neuroscientist, with... and okay. he has to some extent, debunked the idea of mirror neurons. Good. Good. (laughs) I'm pleased to hear that because I'm not a mirror neuron. (laughs) Well, I'm pleased that you're pleased and I'm sure he is too. But but we were sort of having a discussion uh, or a conversation along these lines. And I asked him, and this is something I'm really pondering 
uh, quite a lot is, do you think self-awareness or self-consciousness or whatever we're going to want to call this slightly diffuse concept, do you think it is an on-off switch or do you rather think it's a continuum? Wait, now, do you mean that in the context of different creatures? Or do you mean that in the context of your own sense of self-awareness? I mean, obviously, depending upon your state of mind, depending upon what you're focusing on at the moment, you may be more or less self-aware. Right. So if, if you know, if you're, if you're, if you're, if you're painting a picture, not of yourself, but of a, of a, of a, of a, of a forest scene, then you, you're not going to be in a state of explicit self-awareness while you do that. Right. But if, but if I were to substitute that uh, picture for a mirror, then you would become objectively self-aware. So, so, so some people make a distinction between subjective self-awareness and objective self-awareness. And we frequently mm -hmm. trans, transition, so to speak, in our daily lives back and forth between subjective self-awareness and objective self-awareness. If you can, then, can you define those two two states? Um, well, you're, I mean, I mean, by I mean, as long as you're conscious, as long as you're not asleep, or as long as you're not in a coma, then I assume that you're capable of being self-aware. But whether you're directly self-aware or not is the distinction that applies to indirect and direct self-awareness. Right. Okay. Gotcha. I, I guess I was thinking, or the question that keeps haunting me, <laughs> rather, is sure. so let, let's focus on humans for now. Okay. So for a human that is self-aware, there seems to be, <laughs> to me at least, several potential levels to this. The first one is what we can observe in other non-human primates uh, that you look in the mirror and you realize, hey, that's me. But then there seems to be a second level where you, and I'm not, I don't want to go new age on you here, but where you observe the observer, you're aware that, Absolutely. and that's what we're doing. That's the level you and Absolutely. I operate on. Right? Absolutely. Right. So th I take it that that level is not accessible to other species at the moment. That's a that's a that's a uh, a bone of contention, and I think the jury is still out on the question of mental state attribution in other species. Mm. According to my analysis, to be in a position to make inferences about what other individuals know, want, or intend to do, it presupposes that you're self-aware. Right. Self-awareness is what makes mental state attribution and theory of mind possible. And if you, and if you look at the, at the ontogeny or the developmental history of self-awareness in humans, little kids be the little kids start out, as do most other visually capable creatures, by treating their image in a mirror as though it was another child. They treat right. the image in the mirror as though it, were, were, it, it was a companion. They may even attempt to talk to the uh, image and interact with the image and so on and so forth. But between 18, roughly 18 months of age and two years of age, about 65% of human children reach the point where they can recognize themselves in mirrors. So rather than responding to, the, the, to their image in a mirror as though it were another child, they begin to respond to their image in the mirror as a proxy for their themselves. 
Right. And they can and they can use the mirror to to make faces, to look at the insides of their mouths, and so on and so forth. They can engage right. in a variety of what I would call self-directed behaviors as distinct from other directed behaviors. Other directed behaviors occur under conditions in which the observer treats the image as though it were another person rather than a depiction of themselves. Right. And, and at about the time that little kids begin to learn to recognize themselves in mirrors, they begin to show a variety of other uh, precursors to uh, what eventually becomes a much more complicated uh, capacity for mental state attribution. So prior to learning to recognize themselves in mirrors, if a child is in the presence of another child that becomes distressed, the child will frequently become distressed themselves. Right. So it, the, the distress becomes contagious. At or about the time they learn to recognize themselves in mirrors, however, rather than becoming distressed, they will f- frequently attempt to uh, provide aid and assistance and summon help from adults to resolve the distress in this other child. Right. So they can distinguish between distress they experience and distress other people experience and can respond appropriately to distress in another person. Right. Is this also the stage that is, what, or maybe what you're describing essentially is what we sometimes call object permanency? Object permanency. And, 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 and also at about this point in time, they begin to show, uh, they begin to show visual perspective taking. Mm. So that they 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 begin to become aware of what they might be seeing in the mo- at the moment may be different than what you're seeing at the moment if they're looking at a picture in a book and you're looking at the other side of the book so to speak. Mm. And and right. these are precursors to the development of a, of a theory of mind. Right. But it occurs it occurs incrementally. It doesn't occur that a full-blown theory of mind takes a while to develop. It doesn't emerge overnight. Right. So, so if we return to primates, yes, or non-human primates, of course, right, right, <laughs> right. exactly. How how far do the the most successful or the most self-aware of these primates? How far do they reach in this? developmental hierarchy well let me get let, let's talk a little bit about some methodology and then sure. we can begin to grapple with the the phyletic limits of this of this capacity but some of the more obvious ways to assess not only self awareness but mental state attribution in in other primates would would be to see if they're capable of using their experience to make inferences about experience in other members of the same species. So, right. for example, let's 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 imagine that we had two two chimpanzees that were housed together in the same cage. They are very familiar with one another, and it just so happens that one of those chimpanzees was the was the larger dominant animal, and as a result took priority when it came to when feeding and, and, and access to females and so on and so forth. So there was a dominant animal and a subordinate animal. If we gave the subordinate animal experience with blindfolds, visual obstructions, and then blindfold his cage mate, would he behave differently to his blindfolded cage mate right. as a would, consequence would he understand of, learning, that, right. of learning the consequences of being blindfolded? Would he use his experience with blindfold, so to speak, to then make inferences about his cage mate's ability to, to see or not see right. what he was doing? And would he then take food from the blindfolded cage mate? 
under conditions in which he wouldn't dream of doing that if the blindfolded cage mate wasn't blindfolded. Right. Another example would be if we were to teach a baboon to uh, vocalize when you enter the room and, 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 and every time the baboon vocalizes, you would give him a, a, a peanut or a raisin or an M&M, an incentive, so that the baboon would learn in, in a fairly short period of time that every time you enter the room, if he vocalizes, he'll get a, he'll get a, a, a preferred piece of food. If you then gave the baboon experience with earplugs or headphones so that it impaired his ability to hear, he, that, so he learns that when he's wearing headphones or earplugs, it, it, it obstructs his ability to hear. If you entered the room the next day wearing headphones, would he increase the intensity of his vocal output to take into account your uh, inability to hear? Would he compensate for this inability to hear by raising his, right. not his voice, but his vocalizations? So you can see how, how, how this works. How you I, I, I can, and I sure hope you're going to give me the answer <laughs> to these questions. <laughs> it's a cliffhanger. Um, there, well, what has happened very, very recently, and we're getting way, way ahead of ourselves, but it's, right. that's all right. Right, right. There have there, there, been two camps, so to speak. Those that think that that great apes, which by the way, uh, and we can talk about this in more detail as well, but among primates, the only primates for which there is compelling, rigorous, reproducible, experimental evidence of mirror self-recognition or self-awareness, among <coughs> those primates, there's the recent realization that rather than focusing on species differences, it may be much more profitable to focus on individual differences. Right. And, 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 and let me give you an example. And this comes from the, a recent study with, with humans, where the investigators took a sample of 18-month-old infants, a random sample of 18-month-old infants, and assessed their ability to recognize themselves in the mirror. Right. Roughly half the sample passed the test. The other half failed the test. They did then did uh recordings brain recordings like neuroimaging to see if there were brain differences between the kids that passed the self recognition test and the kids that didn't and they what they discovered was that those that recognize themselves in, in the mirror show patterns of activity in parts of the brain that overlap with the parts of the brain in adults that become active when adults engage in self-focused behavior. Right. So it's so so we now have a way of of beginning to analyze individual differences. And it, and, it, and it turns out that there's now emerging evidence that shows <laughs> that among chimpanzees, some do recognize themselves in mirrors, some don't, just like in the case of 18-month-old uh, children. But there are genetic differences between those that do, if they're adults, and those that don't. Not only are there genetic differences, but there are neurological differences. Chimpanzees that pass the self-recognition test have a thicker cortex 
than those that don't. And those that pass the self-recognition uh, test also excel on other cognitive and social interaction types of tasks. So the ability to recognize yourself in a mirror now extends into both the genetic arena, into the neuroanatomical arena, and into the cognitive social arena. Right. That's very, um, yeah, I don't want to say disturbing, but <laughs> thought provoking. Well, what maybe. it suggests is what I've been arguing all along is that mirror self recognition is mirror. So let me back up. What does it mean to be able to recognize yourself in a mirror? It, it's something that had little or no adaptive value during human evolutionary history. Mirrors were few and far between. Being able to recognize yourself in a mirror, however, means that you're capable of realizing that it's your behavior and not the behavior of another person that's depicted when you look at and interact with the mirror. So it's an index or a proxy for self-awareness. Right. And there's been a, a tremendous amount of controversy about whether mirror self-recognition can be used to index self-awareness or not. And these recent right. studies certainly strongly <clears throat> suggest that uh, uh, mirror self-recognition is, is, is certainly a proxy for Right, uh, right. I, I, I must say, of, of all the literature I studied, I believe you and two other co-authors published a 2002 article or something like that, where you pretty much um, systematically reviewed all the main uh, points of contention or critique made from this assertion. Um, right. And, and I felt like you did a very solid job refuting it. There, some of it was clearly just a case of pure behaviorism. You know, they take some pictures exactly. and, yep. and make yep. it appear as if they can, they can recognize themselves in a mirror. That's exactly That's right. right. Yep. But, but so, I, okay, I do want to back up a, little, a few steps. But, I, but, but, I, but, I, but, but, but before what, we do what, that... Okay, I go ahead. To, I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. It's just the time. No, no, no. Please, please. <laughs> right. Um, I've heard on a couple of occasions, um, like um, very well-known uh, and respected scientist Richard Dawkins, um, the aforementioned Sam Harris, they just mentioned in passing that, oh yes, but self-awareness is is not at all what we understand when we talk about consciousness. But for some reason that sort of rubbed me the wrong way. And I can't help feeling that maybe you, you'll support me in that. <laughs> or or I, I do, you, do you feel there's like a world of difference between self-awareness as demonstrated, if we accept the premise that that is what happens when, 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 uh, when animals recognize themselves in the mirror? It, is it really that different from being conscious, whatever that is? Let me, give it, let me give you some examples. <clears throat> Imagine that you have a pet dog and your dog returns to your house after a, a run in the woods. And you discover when he returns from this run in the woods that he's been quilled by a porcupine. And he's got porcupine quills in his nose and his snout. Out of a concern for your dog's well-being, you've got one of two options. You can either take your dog to a veterinarian and let the veterinarian remove the quills, or you can get a pair of pliers and remove the quills yourself. If you were to opt for the latter, it would probably prove to be an excruciating ordeal for you, because as you 
remove these barbed quills from the dog's nose and witness his reaction, it would be impossible, even though you've never been quilled yourself, you have had painful experiences, and therefore you'd probably generalize your painful experiences to what you assume to be going on inside the dog's head as you remove these barbed quills. How do you think another unrelated dog witnessing that transaction would respond? Any veterinarian can tell you that dogs are oblivious to pain and suffering in other dogs. Right. So I, I, I would interpret that to mean that dogs can experience pain in much the same way that humans can experience pain. But dogs can't use their experience of pain to make inferences about painful experiences in either other dogs or other creatures. Right. Yeah, I, th I think so what, um... it, what it does is it, it opens up a whole new cognitive domain. Right. Where you can now not only begin to make inferences what about what other people know, want, or intend to do, or other 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 individuals, but you can then begin to engage in a variety of introspectively based social strategies, right? Involving involving attribution, involving uh, uh, deception, involving uh, uh, guilt and sorrow, and so on and so forth. Right. So yeah, we it, begin to compete among one another for scarce resources, not so much based on, on brawn, but based on brains. Right. It, it is some, um, okay, maybe it's time to take those steps. Let, but let me, let, let me, oh, just, let, we've got time. As, as long as we've got time. We got time. Let me give you, let me give you a parallel case. <clears throat> Schizophrenics right. seem incapable of identifying the source of their own behavior. One of the classic symptoms of schizophrenia consists of auditory hallucinations. They hear voices, and oftentimes these voices are saying uh, very hurtful, demeaning things. Right. So that to, it, it's, a, it's a source of, of considerable uh, apprehension and anxiety and so on and so forth. It turns out, however, <clears throat> that they aren't hearing voice, other people's voices at all. They're hearing their own covert verbalizations. Schizophrenics, like you and I, carry on conversations with themselves. You carry on conversations with yourself after you, after you leave work and you're going to have to stop and pick up some things at the grocery store and what are you going to do that night and so on and so forth. Schizophrenics carry on covert conversations with themselves as well, as well but they can't identify the source of these voices, so they attribute those voices to other people. If you ask a hallucinating schizophrenic, one that is having auditory hallucinations, to open their mouth as wide as they can, the hallucinations stop. And the reason they stop is because they can't engage in these pre-verbal movements, vocal movements, really? that underpin their inner speech. And That's therefore... <laughs> Please. We're left with the fact that, or the proposition that, the reason they experience these as hallucinations is that they can't identify the source of their own behavior. If you, if you have right. a schizophrenic uh, look at a television monitor in real time, and you have them put their hand uh, on a table so that 
you can now use a video camera to depict the image of their live hand on a, on a, on a screen, on a monitor. If you introduce somebody else's hand next to their hand on that table, which they can only see by looking at the monitor, if you ask them to identify which hand is theirs, they'll tell you that they have no idea. If you tell them while they watch the screen to move their hand, which is, would be the obvious way for you or I, if we had, were uncertain about which of those hands were ours, right. to determine whether it was your hand or somebody else's hand, they still can't do it. They can't identify the source of their own behavior. Right. It's recently been, been, been determined that schizophrenics can tickle themselves. If you ask a schizophrenic right. to tickle themselves, they'll begin to laugh as they tickle themselves. Right. So they don't experience it as self-tickling. They experience it as if somebody else was tickling. So, so, just so they clarify. can't identify the source of their own behavior. Right. It, it yeah. makes sense. But just a, just a clarification here. Is this only during psychotic episodes? Or is no, it... this is 24-7 this is, this is for schizophrenics. Really? Oh, absolutely. So I used to I used to work in in psychiatry and uh, uh -huh. some of these people you probably know you you build personal relationships to them you would sure. call them friends if you weren't being paid to interact with them when you do that for years right and there's this one guy especially that I was uh, pretty close to and he he would just have these episodes you could always tell not always but relatively easy to tell when you when i would show up for work it's like is he normal quote unquote or do, is he having an episode today he was medicated but i was just wondering whether these phenomena would apply to him as well on medication and not during an episode but you're telling me they would yes that is fascinating and i of course i see where you're going with this you're you're we're arriving at we can pinpoint maybe the neural correlates or something something along those lines is that correct well let me give you let me give you an analogy to this to this uh, mirrored hand <laughs> there there was a study done a number of years ago with rhesus monkeys it, and it's important to distinguish between great apes on the one hand and all other primates on the other which frequently people refer to as monkeys sure. although there are some important distinctions but there was a study in which they <clears throat> took mirror-experienced chimpanzees and mirror-experienced rhesus monkeys. Rhesus monkeys show no indication whatsoever, even after periods of extended exposure, which we can talk about more later, right. of ever being able to recognize themselves in a mirror. And what they did was they taught these individual chimpanzees and rhesus monkeys to reach through a hole in a an opaque barrier and then there was a mirror positioned on the other side and on the other side there were platforms and you could bait these different platforms and what they learned to do was reach through the the opening in the in the uh, in the in the uh, in the barrier and then look up and watch their hand in the mirror and they could then use their hand to now locate one of these baited platforms for right. a reason an, or an M &M 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 or what have you. Right. <laughs> Chimpanzees solve that problem almost instantly. Right. Rhesus monkeys never solve the problem. Indeed, mirror experienced rhesus monkeys on occasion as they see their hand moving towards a baited platform will begin to vocalize and threaten the image of their hand in the mirror. Right. So they can't identify the source of their own behavior. That is amazing, it, right? And, and, and schizophrenics, oftentimes in the process of becoming schizophrenic, lose the capacity to recognize themselves in mirrors. They begin to interact with the mirror, talk to the mirror, um right. much can, as can they as um, pre much as pre self-recognizing children do 
So, so I, 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 I assume this, or I interpret what you're saying as uh, for schizophrenics, changes in the brain happens that affect our cognitive states or self-awareness states to some degree. So can, can they regain these abilities over time? I don't think there's any evidence that they can. Okay. Now, whether they experience psychotic breaks and overt psychotic behavior frequently depends on whether they're being medicated. Right. And practically all schizophrenics that have been diagnosed nowadays are maintained on medication. Right. So there's always this medication, uh, this medication compound. Right. Okay. If you're fine with it, this is a good time to take a step back. Okay. Okay. So let's go to the mid sixties when behaviorism was, I I don't know if it was the new thing. It it had been around for a while back then. It was the prevailing paradigm. There's no question about it. Right. Can, Can you just lay out, I mean, I'm familiar with behaviorism, but can you just like the basic tenets or of it? The basic idea behind behaviorism is that <clears throat> mental states don't count. That everything of any consequence is represented by overt instances of behavior. Right. Even, even biology almost doesn't that, count, right? Exactly. Exactly. Right. You, um, you can program and, any, just about any living organism to exhibit any behavior that's right and and if you can if you can program an animal to act as if it recognized itself in a mirror then the behaviorist would say well it obviously has recognized itself in a mirror (laughs) (laughs) the same thing would be true for a robot you could program a robot so that when when it confronted with a mirror it reaches up to to touch something on itself that has been superimposed right but, but 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 then during this during this this rage of of of, of behaviorism, then right. people like Chomsky and yourself comes along, and you start to rock the boat. I, I think I think it's a fair assumption to say, or maybe maybe you want to. I actually overheard you say in an interview I watched just a few days ago that you that you received a letter from Skinner. Is that true? I did. Oh yes. Can yeah. we go into the contents? I'm very curious about it. It's like a historical document. <laughs> well, Skinner and several of his students published an article in which they tried to teach pigeons to recognize themselves in mirrors. Mm. And I took issue with what they'd done and attempted to argue to the contrary. And and in effect, I argued that teaching a pigeon to behave as if it recognized itself in a mirror would be the equivalent of giving someone the answers to an IQ test in advance. (laughs) And if you could teach a pigeon, therefore, to peck the correct answers on a IBM answer sheet, that corresponded to the correct answers on the graduate record exam, and the pigeon scored uh, 1,400, would that be an adequate account of the behavior of of seniors in college taking the graduate record exam? And If it scored 1,400, would that mean that it would qualify for admission to the graduate program at Harvard? (laughs) I mean, mean, today it's it's laughable, right? It 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 seems open shut, but yeah. But it wasn't back then. It wasn't laughable. People took it very seriously and and, and became very defensive at attempts to poke holes. Right. I I guess people... people, People back then could have used the good old uh, extraordinary claims uh, requires extraordinary evidence, right? But you, but yes. you actually had the extraordinary evidence, or at least 
the, the rough outlines of of it emerging. Yes, correct. Right. So, but correct. but I'm, I'm curious to hear. You must have had some suspicion that you what your results would be. How, when when did these suspicions that other non-human that other animals <laughs> than humans right. could could recognize themselves in the mirror could be self-conscious? As a graduate, at, when I was a graduate student, um, I took a graduate course, and one of the things we were supposed to do in this graduate course was to come up with a, an experiment. Not an experiment you had to implement, but an, an idea that could be tested using experimental methodology, and you could then develop the methodology. Mm. And I, and And I found myself one morning uh, thinking about what kind of experiment I wanted to propose while I was shaving in front of the mirror. And it occurred to me as I watched myself shave in front of the mirror, wouldn't it be interesting to see if other animals could recognize themselves in mirrors? And it occurred to me that the obvious way, and it seemed to me, obvious and self-evident, but it never does to other people, that the way to assess that would be to superimpose a mark on the animal's face, like a chimpanzee, that could only be seen in a mirror right. to see if it would then reach up and touch that mark on its face. So in effect, I used my experience with mirrors to make inferences about how a chimpanzee that could recognize itself in a mirror would respond when it saw himself, it's when he saw himself with a with a strange red mark on his face. But but why a chimpanzee? Why not some other primate? Well what what I what I after I proposed this experiment, we they where I when I was a graduate student, they didn't have any chimpanzees. <laughs> but right. but when I took my first academic job uh, several years later at Tulane University down in New Orleans, Louisiana, they were affiliated. They were affiliated with one of the one of the seven national primate centers. They, they administered the, one of the seven national primate centers. And w once I got my appointment there, I contacted the people at the at the at the primate center to see if they'd be willing to let me come over and do some research with, with primates. And I set about trying to assess whether chimpanzees could recognize themselves in mirrors using this mark test procedure. And, and I did the same thing with, with a number of different species of monkeys, macaques, rhesus nice. monkeys and pigtailed macaques and so on and so forth. And the chimpanzees passed the test but the monkeys didn't. And I was more struck by the fact that the monkeys couldn't recognize themselves in mirrors than I was by the fact that chimpanzees could right. recognize themselves so, so, in so, mirrors. So am I getting this right? You, you actually didn't have any specific intuitions. It's not that you hadn't been to the zoo and observed the chimpanzees and thinking, oh, these would probably, it was just a, It was just uh, luck, I guess. Well, I mean, they had chimpanzees at the primate center. Right. And chimpanzees are certainly much more human-like than, than right. pigtail macaques or rhesus monkeys. And so my interest was, was, was drawn to chimpanzees, I guess, because they're much more similar. Right. But to assess this, the, the, the breadth of this capacity, I, I ran the same experiment with three species of monkeys, and they failed to show any evidence of being able to recognize themselves in mirrors. And it, it, and, 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 and it wasn't for months afterwards that I began to think about the significance of being able to recognize yourself in a mirror and what that, what that meant in terms of how you thought about yourself and how you interacted with other people right. and so on and so forth. And, th and that's, yeah. So and it that's... wasn't a sudden, you know, realization, that's for sure.
think about the significance of Gordon's last statement here. The person who invented the very test didn't see its significance, not initially at least. It wasn't until months after having performed the first experiments that he understood the significance of the very experiment he had devised. What it actually means that other animals can recognize themselves in the mirror. This is also a testament to just how much we're all affected by the zeitgeist of the time we live in. And to me, it's also a clear demonstration of how easy it is to forget how our collective thinking can change very fast. What was heresy just last decade can become the new norm. And the really mad thing is that we all seem to forget this. In fact, it seems to me like we just take for granted that, oh yeah, that's how it all, it's always been. In some cases, that really couldn't be further from the truth. Anyway, stay tuned for the second part of this conversation. Things take a really interesting turn as we talk about self-awareness in elephants and dolphins and much, much more. And again, please ask questions. Gordon and I are happy to answer them in a future video. If you prefer just seeing the highlights from these interviews, please go to YouTube and punch in MetaQuest Clips. If on the other hand, you want to start an online business, ClickFunnels is a one-stop solution for that. The basic idea is to take something that already works and tweak it so it fits your product or service. You can build product sales pages, accept payments, manage domains, send out your products, and create powerful marketing campaigns. I've used ClickFunnels since 2017, and you can try it for free for 14 days. If you do go for the free trial, check out the free video courses included. That's what I wish I had started with, just an FYI. Again, try it for free, just click my referral link below. Cheers, and good luck with your business.